So I want to pick up with, I believe we left off in the chapter of the eye of the snake, or towards the end of it. <coughs> um, yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, so let's actually pick up with St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries, Chapter 22, because we want to finish this today. <clears throat> um, and I want to skip the initial parts. In fact, I believe we actually got to um, somewhere around 478, where we're told they receive word from Mrs. Weasley. Dad is still alive, setting out for St. Mungo's now. Stay where you are. George, still alive. That makes it sound. As I finish the sentence. <clears throat> All right. Um, Sirius tells. Harry and the others, but primarily Harry, 481. Harry tells Sirius, let me back up, I think I'm going mad on page 480. Back in Dumbledore's office, just before we took the port key, for a couple of seconds, he says, for a couple of seconds, just before we took the port key, I thought I was a snake. I felt like one. My scar really hurt when I was looking at Dumbledore. I wanted to bite him. Serious. Don't worry about it. It's just the effects of the vision. You were still thinking of the dream or whatever it was. Harry, no, wasn't that. It was like something rose up inside me, like there's a snake inside me. You just need to sleep. You're going to have a break. You're going to have breakfast and then go upstairs to bed, and then you can go and see Arthur after lunch with the others. You're in shock, Harry. You're blaming yourself for something you only witnessed. It's lucky you did witness, this, witness it, etc. Okay, he didn't witness Arthur die, right? Witness the attack. And yet, just a few months previous, he witnessed Sirius get killed. He doesn't go into shock then. So why would he go into shock now? What's Sirius doing? Oh, it's okay, Harry. Everything's going to be fine. You're just, you're overwhelmed with emotion. Okay? How often do people say that kind of thing to Harry? Well, how often do, let me rephrase that, people that Harry really trusts say that kind of thing. Does Dumbledore ever say that kind of thing to Harry? No. Okay. Has Sirius before? No. He says, you're tough enough, you're old enough, you can take this, okay? But what do we find out the next morning or afternoon when they do go to St. Mungo's, okay? The order, some of the members of the order go, <coughs> and I'm hoping my throat voice lasts long enough for the class. And we hear Mr. Weasley, and he's talking about the healers and stuff. And then the kids are kicked out for a bit. 490, 491. Fred and George have brought along their extendable ears. Okay. And Fred and George hands them around. And one of them gives one to Harry. Because they're all outside the room. They want to hear what's being said inside the class, uh, inside the hospital room. Go on, Harry, take it. You saved Dad's life. If anyone's got the right to eavesdrop, it's you. Okay. Does anyone have a right to eavesdrop? What does Dumbledore say about curiosity? It's not a sin, but exercise caution. So, Harry puts it in. They put it on the door, and this is what we hear. I'm going to skip the initial part. You know, Dumbledore, Mrs. Weasley speaking, page 491, 
Dumbledore seems almost to have been waiting for Harry to see something like this. Moody. Yeah, well, there's something funny about the Potter kid. We all know that. Dumbledore seemed worried about Harry when I spoke to him this morning. Of course he's worried. The boy's seeing things from inside you know who snake. Obviously, Potter doesn't realize what that means, but if you know who's possessing him, dash, Harry pulls the ear out, looks at the others. Why does he look at the others? Because they're all listening too. It's not like they only have one extendable ear, and Harry's been the only one to hear this. What would the effect be if Harry had been the only one? How would it be different, let me put it that way? Would there be as much pressure on Harry? No, obviously not. Okay. So what does he do after he hears that? They go back home, or to number 12 Grimmauld Place, and what does Harry do? He goes up to his room and locks the door. He goes up. 492, 493, they're talking about, or Harry's thinking about, when they used, when he used, an extendable ear earlier, at number 12 Grimmel Place, and overheard the Order of the Phoenix talking about Voldemort's after some kind of weapon. And he thinks, top of 493, I'm the weapon. I'm the one Voldemort's trying to use. That's why they've got guards around. It's not for my protection, it's for other people's. Only it's not working. They can't have someone on me all the time at Hogwarts. I did attack Mr. Weasley last night. It was me. Voldemort made me do it. And he could be inside me, listening to my thoughts right now. The only problem with that thought is what? When Harry woke up from what he thinks his attack of Mr. Weasley, what did he not have all over him? blood. His teeth hadn't grown long. This is 493. He's thinking this is before he goes up to his room. Mrs. Weasley, are you okay, Harry? You don't look so well. You feeling sick? They're all watching him. Are you sure you're okay? Bottom of that page. Harry's thinking, how did I become a snake? Maybe I'm an animagus. No, it couldn't be that. Maybe Voldemort's an animagus. Yeah, that would fit him. He would turn into a snake, of course. And when he's possessing me, then we both transform. But that doesn't explain how I got to London and back to my bed in the space of about five minutes. Notice, he's calmed down a little bit. He's starting to think a little bit more rationally. So maybe it wasn't me physically that was there. Top of 494. If Voldemort's possessing me, I'm giving him a clear view into the headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix. That is, if he's possessing me, then I'm becoming what? Louder? Looking glass. A looking glass. A spy. He'll know who's in the Order and where Sirius is. A little bit of foreshadowing there. And I've heard loads of stuff. So he decides, I've got to leave. I'm putting everybody here in danger. Okay. He starts packing. And then the portrait on the wall of Phineas Nigellus, Sirius's ancestor, former head of Slytherin, running away, are we? No. I thought Phineas Nigellus, one of my favorite characters, that to belong in Gryffindor House, you are supposed to be brave. In other words, not so brave now, are we? Looks to me as though you would have been better off in my own house. We Slytherins are brave, yes, but not stupid. For instance, we will always choose to save our own necks. Notice what he is suggesting about Harry. Okay. Question, does Phineas Nigellus really think this. Does he really think Harry's merely trying to save his own neck? Or is he, like Snape, 
knowing exactly which buttons to push to set Harry off. It's not my own neck I'm saving, says Harry. Oh, I see. This is no cowardly flight. You are being noble. Harry ignores him. I have a message for you from Albus Dumbledore. What is it? Stay where you are. I haven't moved. In other words, Harry thinks it means right in the exact spot he's in. So what's the message? I have just given it to you, dolt. <laughs> Dumbledore says, stay where you are. Why? Why does he want me to stay? What else did he say? Nothing. What's that tell us about Dumbledore? He knows exactly what Harry's thinking. Is it because he's practicing from whatever distance away he is, legitimacy, which we do find out Dumbledore can do, so that in the second book, when Harry gets taken up to Dumbledore's office, and Dumbledore asks Harry, Harry, is there, is there anything you want to tell me? Anything at all. And Harry thinks what Ron says, talking about hearing voices that nobody else hears, that's not good. Not even in the wizarding world. Uh, no, Professor, nothing. Does Dumbledore know at that time what Harry... Yes, he does. Right? So, Harry's temper rises to the surface. In other words, that tea kettle is about to... You know, how? Like a snake rearing from long glass, uh, glass, grass. <clears throat> so that's it. Stay there. That's all anyone could tell me after I got attacked by those Dementors. Just stay while the grown-ups sort it out, Harry. We won't bother telling you anything. And then Phineas Nigellus gets his own opportunity to pop off. You know... This is exactly why I loathed being a teacher. Young people are so infernally convinced they are absolutely right about everything. True or false? True. Yeah, it's definitely true. Okay. Has it not occurred to you, my poor puffed up Papa Jay? What's he mean by Poppin' Jay? It's like a brightly colored bird strutting around. What have we already heard Harry think to himself? Oh, I don't know. Back when Ron and Hermione find out they are made prefects. I've done a hell of a lot more than them. He goes through four things he's done. And then when they ask him to teach them defense against the dark arts, they use those exact four things. And Harry's like, yeah, but I had luck in this, and Fox was there, and da 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 right? That there might be an excellent reason why the headmaster of Hogwarts is not confiding every tiny detail of his plans to you. Have you never paused while feeling hard done by? In other words, oh, the world's so unfair. To note that following Dumbledore's orders has never yet led you into harm? No? No, you've never thought about any of that? No, like all young people, you are quite sure that you alone feel and think. You alone recognize danger. You alone are the only one clever enough to realize what the Dark Lord may be planning. Foreshadowing? Not only to the end of this book, but book seven? Oh, yeah. Because, let's just jump to the end for a moment. Why do Harry and the others rush off to the Ministry of Magic? Harry has a vision. What does he assume about that vision, first of all? It's true. What else does he assume? Okay, it's happening right now. What else? He's the only one who can save Sirius. But in opposition to the other times when Harry has thoughts like that, what does Hermione try to get him to do? Slow down there, cowboy. Let's apply some reason. Let's maybe test this vision. So who do they ask to test the vision? 
Do they reach out to Lupin? Nope. They try to reach out to Sirius. They find out Sirius isn't there. Do they reach out to Dumbledore? Do they reach out to McGonagall? Do they reach out to Hagrid? Do they reach out to Snape? No. Who do they reach out to? Creature. Creature. Okay. Yeah, true. Okay. Snape's not. Snape's right there. <laughs> okay. But they don't stop. Hagrid's not there anymore because of the attacks that we're going to see. Okay. And they trust what creature tells them. And yet we're going to discover very shortly, this same chapter, what do we know about creature? What does Creature have in that nice little tiny den in the little closet off the kitchen at number 12, Grimmel Place? Plim, Grimmel Place. What does he have kind of as an altar almost of Bellatrix Lestrange? Who they find out, Harry already knows, did what? Tortured Frank and Alice Long. Is this really somebody we should trust? Somebody who idolizes Osama bin Laden? <laughs> yeah, you had your hand up. Okay. So, Harry. Notice what Harry latches on in that whole conversation, in the, or that whole speech by Phineas Nigelis. Oh, he does have a plan that has something to do with me then. Oh, did I say that? Oops. <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, I have better things to do than to listen to adolescent agonizing. And he goes off. Fine, Harry says. Right? Throws himself face down upon the moth-eaten covers, body, eyes shut, body heaving. So typically teenager angst, you know. The world's so unfair. He felt he had journeyed miles and miles, seemed impossible, less than 24 hours. Cho had been approaching him under the mistletoe. He was tired. He's scared. He falls asleep. And there's that vision again. There's that black door. And he wakes up. He hears Ron. How is Harry convinced he can't be possessed by Dumbledore? Ginny, what proof does Ginny use? She remembers being possessed by, not Dumbledore, Voldemort. She remembers being possessed by Voldemort. And uh, she says, well, when Harry says, I didn't want anyone to talk to me, four ninety nine. dollars Well, that was a bit stupid. She says, you don't know anyone but me who's been possessed by you-know-who. I can tell you how it feels. He's like, oh yeah, I forgot. Jenny, lucky you. <laughs> so what's it like being possessed? Uh, can you remember everything you've been doing? Big blank periods where you don't know what you've been up to? Like, oh, I don't know, strangling roosters and daubing their blood on the walls, you know? Harry, no. Then you know who hasn't ever possessed you. When he did it to me, I couldn't remember what I'd been doing for hours at a time. I'd find myself somewhere, not know how I got there. Harry hasn't gone to sleep in one place and woken up somewhere else. That dream about your dad, the snake, though. You've had those dreams before. Hermione, you had flashes of what Voldemort was up to last year. Notice, Hermione's using the name. Harry, that was different. I was inside the snake this time. I was the snake. She goes, Harry, sometime you're finally going to turn around and read Hogwarts history, and you're going to realize you can't apparate and disapparate out of Hogwarts. Right? Ron, you didn't leave your bed. I saw you thrashing, right? You know. Right? So, um, let's see, we're going to skip a bunch. 
Hermione leaves a present for Creature. And Sirius asks, has anyone seen Creature? Harry, I haven't seen him since the night we came back here. You were ordering him out of the kitchen. Remember what Sirius actually says? He doesn't say, Creature, get out of the kitchen. He says, get out of here. And what do we come to discover about house elf magic and the orders given them by their masters? Louder? They take it literally? It can be open to interpretation. That's why, like my quizzes I've come to learn. I've got to learn to be very, very literal. Like, if I'm specifying, you know, whom does, uh, who receives the Cruciatus curse from Voldemort in this book? Excuse me, not in this book. Was it in this book? No, the previous book. Well, I wanted it to be Avery. Because in the chapter, Priori and Katatum, when all the Death Eaters come back, Avery gets sucked. But who else received it? Because I didn't specify it in that particular chapter. Harry has a vision of Wormtail receiving the Cruciatus curse. Right? So you got to be very specific. Creature, get out! Can be interpreted to mean leave the house. And what do we come to discover a creature does when Sirius tells him, get out? He leaves the house. Where does he go? Malfoy Manor. Okay? So, Sirius says, when Harry asks, he couldn't have left, could he? I mean, when you said out, maybe he thought you meant get out of the house. No, no, no. House elves can't leave unless they've been given clothes. They're tied to the family's house. Harry, mm, no. <laughs> I'm only 15. I know this a little better than you. They can leave the house if they really want to. Dobby did. He left the Malfoys to give me warnings two years ago. Had to punish himself. Sirius looked slightly disconcerted for a moment. Then says, I'll look for him later. Why? Why I'll look for him later? Gets to something Dumbledore says about Sirius at the end. What does he think of Creature? Two words. Yeah, very little or not much. <laughs> okay. And that becomes his downfall. So they go off to St. Mungo's again to visit Mr. Weasley. They see Lockhart. Why does she throw Lockhart in here? A little bit of levity? It's got to be it. Because do we ever see Gilderoy Lockhart again? Nope. Completely out of mind. But we do see, page 512 and following, and I'll go more quickly after this, we do see they're on the closed ward, and there's Broderick Bode, <coughs> on the closed ward, and a plant has just been delivered to them. Should they know what this plant is? Especially Harry, Ron, Hermione. Yeah, because they've had it trying to strangle them several years ago. They've also talked about it, all of them. In what class? Herbology with Professor Sprout. And we hear, page 512, oh, Mrs. Longbottom, are you leaving already? One of the healers, nurses, says to Neville's grandmother, Harry's head spun around. Notice it doesn't say Harry spun around. I don't know if he's going all exorcist on us. You know. Curtains had been drawn back from the two beds at the end of the ward. Two visitors were walking back down the aisle between the beds. Formidable-looking old witch wearing a long green dress, moth-eaten fox fur, and a pointed hat decorated with what, what was undoubtedly a stuffed vulture. In other words, Snape's outfit. <laughs> from Prisoner of Azkaban. Harry wants to try to get 
Ron, Hermione, Ginny. So Neville has his secret kept. Ron, Neville! Neville jumps. It's us, Neville! Duh. <laughs> Friends of yours, Neville, dear, Mrs. Longbottom says. Notice, bearing down upon them all. What kind of person is Neville's grandmother? Scary, Scary intimidating. Maybe you didn't have, I had a grandmother like this. You know, like if you've ever been around chickens, like a big old Rhode Island red that just <laughs> intimidates all the other little bantam chickens. Okay? That's what she's like. Neville looks as though he'd rather be anywhere in the world but here. Like, maybe even in Snape's class. <laughs> ah, yes, she says, looking at Harry, sticking out a shriveled, claw-like hand, a hand that's kind of like, I'm being pretty loose here, the thing that Harry sees reach its hand out from under the Dementor's cloak. <laughs> Yes, yes, I know who you are, of course. Neville speaks most highly of you. Uh, thanks, says Harry, shaking hands. You two are clearly Weasleys. Hair gives them away. Yes, I know your parents. Not well, of course, but fine people, fine people. And you must be Hermione Granger. Hermione looks startled. Yes, Neville's told me all about you. Helped him out of a few sticky spots, haven't you? He's a good boy. But he hasn't got his father's talent. Wow, that's low. <laughs> I'm afraid to say. And she jerks her head towards the back of the room. Ron, what? Is that your dad down there, Neville? What's this? Haven't you told your friends about your parents, Neville? No. <laughs> well, it's nothing to be ashamed of. You should be proud, Neville, proud. They didn't give their health and their sanity so their only son would be ashamed of them, you know. I'm not ashamed. Well, you've got a funny way of showing it. My son and his wife, she says, were tortured into insanity by you know who's followers. Hermione and Jenny. Ron stops <laughs> trying to look over the barrier to see Neville's parents. They were Aurors, you know and very well respected within the wizarding community. Highly gifted, the pair of them. I, yes, Alice dear, what is it? And Alice dear walks down, carrying a piece of paper about this long. Okay. Neville's mother had come edging down the ward in her nightdress. She no longer had the plump, happy-looking face Harry had seen in Moody's old photograph of the original Order of the Phoenix. Her face was thin and worn now. Her eyes seemed overlarge. Her hair, which had turned white, was wispy and dead-looking. She did not seem to want to speak, or perhaps she was not able to, but she made timid motions toward Neville, holding something in her outstretched hand. Now, the description we get of Alice Longbottom Matches what in our world? Most of you probably haven't experienced this. Exactly. My mom died of Alzheimer's two years ago. It's the exact, I mean, this could be my mom walking down this corridor while she could still walk. Again, says Mrs. Longbottom. Very well, Alice dear, very well. Neville, take it, whatever it is. Notice what this tells us about Alice Deere. Is she completely gone? No, she is not. Okay. Neville had already stretched out his hand, into which his mother dropped an empty Drupal's glowing gum wrapper. Very nice, dear, says Neville's grandmother, in a falsely cheery voice. Neville. Thanks, Mom. What is this? What is this for Neville? What day is it? It's Christmas on the closed ward. 
This is what? This is Neville's Christmas present from his mother. What does he do with it? He keeps it. What does Mrs. Longbottom tell him to do? Throw it away. Why? It's trash, right? <laughs> it's just trash. It's junk. But for Neville, it's treasure. Why? Because the paper, piece of paper in and of itself means nothing. It's what? What do we always tell people? Or what is always said? It's the thought that counts. And what is the show? There is thought that counts in Alice Longbottom's mind. What about Mrs. Longbottom? Old witch Longbottom. And I can actually say that without it being you know, <laughs> bad. Nope. His mother tottered away, back up the ward, humming to herself. Neville looked around at the others. Notice, his expression, defiant, like, say something. <laughs> I dare you, say something. As though daring them to laugh. But Harry did not think he'd ever found anything less funny in his life. Well, we'd better get back. Very nice to have met you all. Neville, put that wrapper in the bin. She must have given you enough of them to pay for your room by now. So what does that mean? She must have given you enough of them to pay for your room. Every time Neville comes and visits his mother, she gives him one of these. How often does he come? We're not told. Though Dumbledore did say, previous book, he believes Neville visits his parents Every time he's on holiday, that is, Christmas holidays, Easter holidays, summer vacation, he visits his parents. We're not told how often during that period. I kind of assume it's more than once during the Christmas holidays, and more than once during the Easter week, and more than once during the summer. Because if she says... You have enough of those to paper your bedroom by now. She means you've got enough of these little probably one by two and a half inch strips to wallpaper your entire room. That tells us how often Neville visits. I would say it's probably every day when he's not in school. Because how long have his parents been here? His whole life, essentially. Not quite. His parents die, excuse me, his parents are rendered insane after Harry's parents die. So Neville is a little older than a year, at least, when his parents have this happen to them and they go off to St. Mungo's. Because Neville's born the same year, same summer, same month, we're going to find out, as Harry. Not same day, but they're both born in July. Okay. And Neville's parents had this happen to them when? After Voldemort's downfall, we were told. Okay. As they left, Harry was sure he saw Neville slip the wrapper into his pocket. Hermione, I never knew. Ron, nor did I. Ginny, nor me. Harry, I did. Notice, they all look at Harry. Dumbledore told me, but I promised I wouldn't mention it. That's what Bellatrix Lestrange got sent to Azkaban for, using the Cruciatus curse on Neville's parents until they lost their minds. Hermione, Bellatrix Lestrange? That woman creature's got a photo of him in his den? In other words, hmm, maybe creature isn't what the creature I thought it was, you know? So, Harry goes back, they all go back, and now we're going to zip. He discovers, he has to learn occlumency. What is occlumency? It's defensive magic. It's the ability to what? Occlude your mind. What does that mean? Pull shades down. 
so that others can't see inside. Who are the others they don't want seeing inside? Bully. Okay? And who is Harry blessed enough to have teach him occupancy? Why snake? Because he is a superb occupant. How do we know? Because he's a spy. He has to go, we don't see it here, but he has to go in front of Voldemort regularly and do what? <laughs> you know? Isn't he described as like one of the best of gentlemen ever? Who? Uh, Voldemort. Yes. What does Voldemort repeatedly say to people? You can't, don't lie to Lord Voldemort. He always, notice not I. He always speaks of himself in third person. What a pompous arrogant you know. <laughs> He always knows. You know, right? So Snape tells him about occlumency. 3, 530, 531. He says, it's the ability to extract feelings and memories from another person's mind. Well, what have we already seen Harry repeatedly do when somebody explains something to him and it's not clear? He puts it in his own words. He can read minds. Snape. And I kind of imagine Snape just puts his head in his hand like this. You have no subtlety, Potter. You do not understand fine distinctions. It's one of the shortcomings <laughs> that makes you such a lamentable potion. And Harry's like, okay, come on. Only muggles talk of mind reading. The mind is not a book to be opened at will and examined at leisure, like, oh, I don't know, Tom Riddle's diary. What about a pensive? Can that be opened at will and read like a diary? Yeah, it pretty much can. But that's thoughts. It's not quite the same as the mind. So, why do I have to learn this? Harry asks. Middle of 531. Snape says, because the usual rules don't seem to apply to you. In other words, I don't have to be looking at you. Or, more specifically, Voldemort doesn't have to be looking at you. He doesn't have to be near to you in order to extract things from your mind. And notice, what does Snape call Voldemort? The Dark Lord. Repeatedly. Snape keeps, uh, Harry keeps interrupting him. Right? And page 534. He has his first real lesson. What are you going to do, Harry says? I'm about to break into your mind. We're going to see how well you resist. I've been told that you have already shown aptitude resisting the imperious curse. So, braces. Notice, what kind of direction does he give him? It's like Lockhart, you know, give your wand a little swishy swish. Brace yourself. Basically throw me the defense. Yeah. Okay. Snape had struck before Harry was ready. And what is what happens? Harry's five, watching Dudley riding a new red bicycle. And his heart was bursting with jaws. He's nine. Ripper the bulldog was chasing him up a tree, and the Dursleys were laughing. He's under the sorting hat. It's telling him he would do well in Slytherin. Hermione's lying in the hospital wing, her face covered with thick black hair. A hundred dementors are closing in on him. Cho, drawing nearer to him, make the out for the kill, you know, under the mistletoe. And Harry's like, uh-uh, ain't going there, buddy. <laughs> Blocks him off. Snape, did you mean to produce a stinging hex? Harry, no. He goes, you let me in too far. Harry, did you see everything I saw? Eh, to whom did the dog belong? My Aunt Marge. He goes, for a first attempt, that was not as poor as it might have been. What is that for Snape? A yeah, that's a compliment. That's praise. He says, but you managed to stop me eventually. Repel me with your brain and you won't need to use your wand. Harry, you're not telling me how. Matters, Potter. Okay. Does it again. 
Black uh, Dragon, Cedric. No. Notice now Snape starts telling Harry how. Empty yourself of emotion. Okay, so how easy is that to do? Even in the best of situations, you're out, you're, you know, in the mountains, you come across this alpine lake, you by yourself, maybe one other person, you sit there, you just take in all the beauty, you're at peace, you're calm. Is it still easy to remove all emotions? Because what does it mean to remove all emotions? To become apathetic, not apathetic. Apathetic means you don't give a damn. That is an emotion. Apathetic means you feel nothing. In other words, it's to feel the way you feel when someone puts you under an appearance curse. All concern washed away. Yeah, well, I'm finding that hard at the moment, Harry says then you will find yourself easy prey for the Dark Lord. Why? Notice what Snape says, and notice how he says it. Savagely. Fools who wear their hearts proudly on their sleeves, who cannot control their emotions, who wallow in sad memories, and allow themselves to be provoked this easily. Weak people, in other words. They stand no chance against his powers. Weak people, in Snape's mind, are what? People who show emotion. Does Snape show emotion? Has he shown emotion in earlier books? Can you be mean and not full of emotion? Yeah, you can. Okay. Can you strike somebody and not do it out of anger? Yes, you can. Okay. Harry, I'm not weak. Prove it. Next two words. Master yourself. There it is again. Self-control. Control yourself. Put reins on the self. Very. So, again. And this time, he's running down the corridor. And now he understands what the corridor is. And Snape's like, why are you dreaming about that corridor? <laughs> what is that corridor? Harry, I don't know. What's in the Department of Mysteries? What did you say? I said, what's in the Department of Mysteries, sir? <laughs> he says, many things are in the Department of Mysteries, and none of them are any of your business. Right? So Snape tells him to practice. Harry has another vision. Okay, I skip a bunch. And Harry discovers in the vision, Voldemort's really happy. Okay? He tells us, 542, something he's been hoping for. He has something's good happened. Something he's been hoping for. What is that something? Is it the mass breakout? Or is it that Harry now realizes what that door leads to? What does Voldemort need? Prophecy, Department of Mysteries. Who can get it? Okay. Why is Broderick Bode at St. Mungo's? Malfoy used the Imperius Curse on him to try to get him to get the prophecy. Why did Malfoy use the Imperius Curse on Broderick Bode? Because Avery said he'd be able to get it. To get it. We're going to see a vision later where Rookwood is going to inform Voldemort, no, Bode never would have been able to get it. Rookwood knows only the people the prophecy is about can actually touch the prophecy. Okay. Why is Broderick Bode there? Is he there because of the Imperius curse? It's because he touched the prophecy and his mind was confronted by it. So, 25, Beetle at Bay. Then we discover there's the mass breakout. What is the beetle at bay? Read a skeeter at bay. What does that mean? Like there's dogs, got her up a tree. Who's the dogs? Hermione. Little tiny Hermione, you know. 
How does she have her at bay? I know who and what you are, and if you don't do what I want you to do, I'm going to let everybody else know. What is it Hermione wants her to do? Right, write Harry's story. Write Harry's story. Okay. So, just before then, before their meeting with, uh, yeah, I'm going to skip it. The date with her, the date with Joe, and she, Harry mentions Hermione, and Joe walks off all peevishly. It's like, good riddance. Um, so they have the meeting with Rita Skeeter, 566 and 67. Harry says, I was there. There are a bunch of Death Eaters. Would you want their name? She says, I'd love them. And he gives them all. But then she says, but little miss, you know, here, she doesn't want that story out, does she? And Hermione goes, no, actually, that's exactly the story I want. Okay, 567. Rita. There's no market for that. In other words, Hermione says, I want you to tell the story, the true story, all the facts, exactly as Harry reports them. He'll give you all the details. The Death Eaters, the discovered Death Eaters, everything. Prophet won't print it, she says. In case you haven't noticed, nobody believes this cock and bull story. Everybody thinks it's delusional. Hermione, we don't need another story about how Harry's lost in marbles. We've had plenty of those. I want him to tell the truth. There's no market for a story like that. What does she mean? There's no market for the truth. People don't want the truth. They want what? Sweet, sweet lies. They want sweet lies. They want their fears confirmed. Okay. Here's a little example. No, I don't know. Does this work? I don't know. We'll see. The CIA released... A whole mess of documents yesterday. Okay. Anybody know one of the things that was included in those documents? I mean, we had Osama bin Laden's handwritten journal, over 280 pages. But you know one of the other little bits that came out in that? We had been told since 9-11, um, Osama bin Laden and his group would not have anything to do with Iran. Why? Different form of Islam, like Protestants and Catholics, essentially. Okay? They don't mix. The two hate each other. And what comes out in those CIA documents? They were working together long after 2001. As late as even 2012. Okay? Iran was giving instructions to Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda about who to hit. Who do you think they were telling them to hit? The United States. Who knew all of this in 2015 when we signed a quote-unquote agreement with Iran regarding nuclear weapons and such? President. Why was this kept secret? Because there's no market for the truth. Why was the attack at Fort Hood? And I had a student in one of my classes whose husband was killed at Fort Hood, and she was injured because she was a soldier at Fort Hood when that attack happened. Why was Fort Hood called workplace violence? doesn't mess up the narrative. Because the narrative was, we're at peace now. There aren't any terrorist attacks on United States territory anymore. You mean the prophet won't print it, Hermione says, because Fudge won't let them. So where do they print it? In the National Enquirer. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to skip a bunch. We get a new educational decree after the Quibbler prints it, and the Quibbler sells out notice, something that's never happened before. In the new educational decree, 581, 
any student found in possession of the magazine, the quibbler will be expelled. Well, what does that automatically ensure? <laughs> See, Martin Scorsese directed a film back in 1987 that was a low-budget film that nobody virtually in the United States had read the novel it was based on, and this film would have gone down to an ignominious defeat. Nobody would have seen it. If it weren't for a bunch of Christians coming out of the woodwork going, oh, you can't see this film, it's blasphemous. The Last Temptation of Christ. Okay? Because all the Christians came out of the woodwork, evangelicals, Protestant, Catholic, whatever, all of them, I mean, we're really pissed off at this. Okay? They organize this big hula blue, and what happens? Now everybody wants to see what the hula blues all about. Okay? Same thing. You ban students from reading something, what are they going to do their damnedest to do? I'm going to read whatever that is. Okay? So, people start coming up to Harry, saying, I knew it all along. Seamus comes up, 583, I believe you, and I've sent a copy of that magazine to be ma'am. Okay? Five eighty-five. Harry has the vision. Rookwood, poor Avery, guy who just can't do anything right. Psst, you know, get zapped again. Uh, let me skip a bunch. And Harry has another occlumency lesson. He tells. Snape, it was just a dream. Dreams like, Snape's like, how did that room happen to be in your mind and those people? Because Snape sees part of the dream. Right? And what does Snape tell him? 591. It's not up to you to find out what the Dark Lord is saying to his death eaters. Snape, no, that's your job, isn't it? That shouldn't be Harry. It's your job, isn't it? He didn't mean to say it. What did he not do? Practice self-control. Snape, yes, Potter, it is my job. So, why aren't they worried that Harry can give away Snape to Voldemort? The whole reason Dumbledore, Dumbledore isn't teaching Harry is what? They don't want to give Voldemort access to Dumbledore's thoughts, possibly. So, Snake, they don't care about? I kind of think that's a little flaw. Okay? But now, this time, when Harry's put under, Harry sees memories that aren't his own. Suddenly, 592 at the very top. Suddenly, Harry's mind was teeming with memories that were not his. his. A hook-nosed man was shouting at a cowering woman while a small, dark-haired boy cried in a corner. A greasy-haired teenager sat alone in a dark bedroom, pointing his wand at the ceiling, shooting down flies. A girl was laughing as a scrawny boy tried to mount a bucking broomstick. Snape shaking slightly, white in the face. Why is he white? Scared. He's scared. At what? Harry got in. Harry saw things nobody is supposed to see. Remember? People who are weak, who wear their emotions on their sleeve. Is he wearing them on his sleeve? Where are these emotions? Buried deep within. And Harry saw them. Notice, Harry did not speak. He thought, if I say anything, I'm dead. Snape, let's try again, shall we? This time, the door flies open. Okay? So, Harry finally asks, why do you call the, uh, Voldemort the Dark Lord? Okay? 
So we're going to skip a bunch. Um, Trelawney gets sacked. Ferenc becomes teacher of divination. Ferenc points to the star above them, a red star, page 603. He says, for the last decade, wizard kind has been living through nothing more than a brief calm between two wars. What's the last decade? Well, when's this book published? 2003. What's the last decade? Essentially, 1993 till then. Within the world of the book, that's not the decade. Okay? But within the publication history, it is. What happened in, oh, right around 1991? Late fall? Louder. Desert storm. Okay? That was summer. Actually, not 91, 89. The fall of the Berlin Wall. The end in 91 of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union dissolved and became instead its individual republics again. Okay? The famous historian wrote a, an article, in, which became a book, in the early 90s called The End of History. Why? Because it was the end of everything that dominated the 20th century. I mean, yeah, you have World War I at the beginning, but what happens during World War I? The Bolshevik Revolution, the rise of communist Russia, and the division of the world into East and West. Okay? And from that period on, that's pretty much what governs the next 70 years. The reason you guys didn't grow up under duck and cover drills was because the Soviet Union ended in 1989. Okay? Is that the low between the wars, kind of, that Ferenc is talking about? Because what happened in 2001? A new kind of war. But it wasn't really 2001. When did that new kind of war really begin? It wasn't even 1993 with the first World Trade Center bomb. Yeah, Lockerbie, even before then. you got to go back to the rise of the terrorist networks in the 1960s. See, the 1970s, there were terrorist events around the world. It's when you had the rise of hijacking. You had the 72 Olympics and the Jewish um, Olympians murdered by who? PLO, Yasser Arafat, the same guy... Bill Clinton shook hands with in the White House. Okay? That's like shaking hands with Hitler, just on a lesser extent. Okay? So he says, there's been this lull. What's he mean by a lull? Mars is bright tonight. The war is back. A new beginning. Okay? End of the previous chapter. So... Harry leads the class, DA, and Dobby comes and warns him. Okay? The sneak. Harry gets caught, taken off to Dumbledore's office. 610, 611. I'm trying to move quickly. And we see a bunch of people in Dumbledore's office. There's Dumbledore, there's McGonagall, there's Fudge, Kingsley Shackable, Dollish. Percy, okay. Percy the P. Rick. <laughs> uh, um, Umbridge, yeah, what's her name? Marietta. Okay. So, skipping a bunch. Who admits to the DA? Dumbledore. He says, notice, it's called. Dumbledore's army. It's not called Potter's army. Tonight was the first meeting. Okay? So you can't do anything to Harry. Right? He didn't do anything, etc. Page 618. Dumbledore kind of says, shoot, you caught me. Darn, I'm really disappointed. 
Would you like a written confession, Cornelius, or will a statement? And Harry saw McGonagall and Kingsley look at each other. They're looking at each other like, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> Fudge. They, well, I, you want an admission? Yeah. You were, re yes. Harry says, no, this isn't going to, Dumbledore, quiet, Harry, or I'm afraid you will have to leave my office. Notice what Dumbledore is kind of acting like there. Still in charge. <laughs> This is my office. Shut up, Potter. Okay. So, Fudge says, you'll be escorted back to the ministry where you will be formally charged, sent to ask man double dirt. I thought we'd run into that little snag. Snag? What, what snag? I don't see a snag. Well, I do. Really? What is it? You seem to be laboring. I just love this part. Under the delusion that I'm going to, let's see, what is the phrase? Come quietly. <laughs> I'm afraid not going to come quietly at all, Cornelius. I have absolutely no intention of being sent to Azkaban. I could break out, of course. Notice the hubris there. <laughs> Your little prison out in the middle of the ocean, not going to contain me. But what a waste of time. And frankly, I can think of a whole host of things I would rather be doing. You know, gardening, knowing Dumbledore, needlework, you know. Fudge. You're going to oppose me? And notice, Dumbledore sees Dollish fiddling with his wand. Don't be silly, Dollish. I'm sure you're an excellent or I seem to remember you achieved outstanding in all your news. What's he just done? Slam! I remember you when you were a teenager. <laughs> Put it away, boy. <laughs> he blinks, looking rather foolish. Fudge. So you intend to take on Dollish, Shackable, Dolores, and myself single-handed, do you? Merlin's beard, no. Not unless you're foolish enough to force me to. <laughs> and it's almost like Harry and McGonagall are probably sitting there going, oh, <laughs> this I gotta see. Okay? They do, and he does. <laughs> right? What did Kingsley do to Marietta? Did he obliviate her memory? Or did he put her under an imperious curse that stopped her from telling the truth? Or did he confund her? Confound her? Okay. Modifying 621, Miss Edgecombe's memory like that while everyone was looking the other way, Dumbledore says. So, modifying her memory... Which is worse, <laughs> modifying her memory or imperious? It's not a unforgivable. When you modify somebody's memory, you like mess with their soul. Like, you know, yeah. like they're being. <laughs> this is intellectual. What? Okay, you guys don't want to use the bad word, do you? It's mental <laughs> rape. It's rape. What's he doing? He's taking something of hers that should never be taken. And yet, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay for wizards, apparently, to go in and obliviate other people's memories or change them. What does Hermione do to her parents? Book 7. She wipes away their memories of their ever having a daughter. Why? So that they will be out of danger. Does that mean she wipes them away and puts them in a pensive somewhere so that in the end she can get them back? We're not told. How bad is that? That's, is, is that really much worse than Avada Kedavra? In terms of their knowing they have a daughter. Their daughter is, for all intents and purposes, what? You can't even say dead to them. Because as if, it's as if she's never was. That's even worse than being dead to them. Like they would walk up, maybe meet her on the street, and not know who she is, and she would know perfectly well who they are. But wizarding justice, man. <laughs> it's pretty screwed up in terms of what is seemingly allowed and what's not allowed. 
Okay, so we get Snape's worst memory. Who becomes new headmaster? Uh, excuse me, Stris. Umbridge. Dumbridge. Let's just call her Dumbridge. <laughs> okay. So, Harry has another vision. He goes through the black door. He's in a circular room with a bunch of doors. Cho tries to apologize about Marietta. Harry's like, 637. Yeah, well. <laughs> Cho, she's a lovely person, really. She just made a mistake. Harry's like, made a mistake? Well, we all got away, didn't we? Go away. You know, just... Cho needs to have happen to her what happens to Colin Creed. Just... Sorry, I'm just like that. Um, so... Let's see here. Here he's having occlumency lesson with Snape, and Snape gets called away by Malfoy. What does Harry see in Snape's office? Pensive. Is it Eve Apple. Is it still just the one or is it just a separate? It's Dumbledore, he borrows. Borrows. We're told that. Okay. Harry sees the gun. He's like, I've just got to. <laughs> What's he hiding, you know, in there? And what does Harry see? Ordinary wizarding levels. In other words, Snape is what? Harry's age. Okay. And what do we see in this memory? Page 641. Harry goes in. Okay, the memory is Snape's, right? How should it be shot? From what perspective should the memory be driven? Snape's. It ought to be through Snape's eyes. So what should Harry see? Paper in front of him. And maybe Snape looks up and he sees other people. But when Harry goes in, how is it? It's kind of like a third person. Like watching him. You know? Say Snape is sitting here at my computer. It's like Harry comes in through the door and says, huh. Well, how, how does that work? Same kind of thing happened when he went into Dumbledore's thoughts. He doesn't see everything from Dumbledore's perspective. Why? Because he sits next to Dumbledore. Okay. I think this is a problem with her portrayal of these. Because we're going to see... Harry sees what else? Sirius, James, Pettigrew. Skip a bunch. The exam finishes. Sirius, James, Remus, Pettigrew leave. Where is Snape? Not with them. Right? They're not saying, hey, Sev, come on, join us. Because the sorting hat wants us all to be friends. You know? They go off, and we overhear Lupin and Mooney, excuse me, Lupin and Sirius talking and such. They're talking about the test, the questions, you know. Transfiguration, pff, it's a breeze. Notice how Sirius talks regarding the exam in school. I know it all. And he seemingly does. Notice, Sirius isn't a blower. Sirius is really smart. As is James, unlike his son. <laughs> okay. So they go off by the lake, page 645. James is standing there. He's got a snitch in his hand. He lets it go. It flies away. He jumps, catches it. While he does that, girls are walking around. He's doing this. Lupin, being the intellectual, sitting next to a tree, reading a book. Pettigrew is about to pee himself because he's so excited by James playing with the thing. And Sirius is just standing there looking like James Dean, you know, the rebel. Sirius, 645. I'm bored. I wish it was full moon. 
Now, what does that mean? I wish it was full moon so you, Lupin, would transform into a werewolf. Yeah, but what does that mean for Lupin? Pain. pain. <laughs> Great pain. But then they would also transform into their Animagi forms, which they master this year. Okay? That's why he's saying, now that I can do it, this is fun. Lupin's probably going, not so much. <laughs> okay? James, this will liven you up, Petfoot. Look who it is. Excellent. Snipless. He had become very still, like a dog that is sent to the rabbit. Snape was on his feet again, stowing the owl paper in his bag. He emerges from the shadows of the bushes, set off across the grass. Notice, Snape's way over there. there how is Harry in Snape's memory over here? Does the memory work somehow? We're not aware. Are, are we individually like panopticons? Look it up if you don't know what it is. It's scary as all hell. Think of Google. Google and Facebook put together. Okay. So what do we see happen? They torture Snape, right? Okay, maybe torture is too, too strong a word. It's not like he has scars forever. Physical. He does have scars forever, right? What's the scar? What never leaves him? I don't need your, how does he put it? I don't need help from filthy little mud bloods like her. Exact middle of 648. Why is that a scar that never leaves? She loved the Love. We don't find that out till later. Okay. Snape's worst memory is not being turned upside down by James and Sirius. So that his robes fall and everybody sees his underwear. That it's bad, but that's not the worst memory. Okay. 649. So been enjoying yourself, Potter? No. Amusing man, your father, wasn't he? Notice what Snape does there. He directs Harry's attention away from what? Lily. He wants Harry to think what? He wants Harry to think it's the worst memory because it has to do with his father. He doesn't want Harry to go where? Deeper. I, I didn't. You will not repeat what you saw to anybody. Harry. <laughs> of course not. And we're done. You're on your own against the Dark Lord at this point, kid. Okay? So we have career advice. What does Harry want to be when he grows up? An Auror. And yet he's not an Auror in the ridiculous half ass play. Cursed child. Okay. I don't need some. He's like a Yeah, he's a bureaucrat. And Hermione's Minister of Magic. Sorry if I gave that away, but utterly ridiculous. Okay. So, what does Harry do? He calls up Lupin and Snape. Not literally, he goes to a fireplace. And he talks to them. What do they tell him? Page 670. Yeah. Lupin says, Harry, come on. James was only 15. Harry, I'm 15. And I'm not a prick like he was. James and Snape hated each other from the moment they set eyes on each other. I think James was everything Snape wanted. Be. Popular, good at Quidditch, good at pretty much everything. Handsome, you know, other than being scrawny. Right? Serious, I'm not proud of it. That is, I'm sorry you saw that, Harry. I'm not proud of it. Harry, he kept messing up his hair. Sirius and Lupin laughed. I forgot he used to do that. What's that show us about James? Remember what happens when Percy is made prefect and Harry is taken to school with the rest of the Weasleys, excuse me, 
taking the platform nine and three quarters and a Ministry of Magic car, and they replace the the placards on the front of the car that have something like M O M with H B. Remember the sign, the the, the you know, badge that he wears that Fred and George magically transform it so it stands for not sorry not prefect head boy. So it's not head boy, it's big head. <laughs> That's James. James was an egomaniac. Okay. So, we find out James and, and Snape never passed an opportunity to curse each other in the hallway, etc., etc. Okay. Drop. Uh, ordinary wizarding levels, I'm going to skip. Other than, where does have a, Harry have a vision and what is the vision? Where does Harry seemingly always have visions? With this one exception. Test. Which test? History. History magic. Benz's class. Okay. What's the vision? Snape. Department of Mysteries. Surrounded by Voldemort et al. And Harry thinks, I've got to save him. Okay. So he finds Ron and Hermione. Page 734. Hermione tries to get him to slow down. She says, I'm trying to say Voldemort knows you, Harry. He took Ginny into the Chamber of Secrets. Why to lure you there? It's the kind of thing he does. He knows you sort of... Harry, you don't get it. I'm not having nightmares. I'm not just dreaming. These things are really happening. Okay? Luna tells Harry he's being rude. So it's Hermione who says we need proof. What's the proof they get? Creature. Okay. What happens just after they talk with Creature? They get caught by McGonagall, Snape, uh, McGonagall, Malfoy, etc. Not McGonagall, uh, Umbridge. What does Umbridge do or threaten them with? Right. Cruciatus curse. She actually does it, right? Tries. Till Hermione does. Okay, we'll get it. So they lead um, Umbridge where? Why into the Forbidden Forest? Okay, why else? Grop. Hermione knows about Grop, and what do we know about Grop and Hermione? Something weird. <laughs> There's a connection there of sorts. So Grop and the Centaurs rescue them, and we get the flight to the Department of Mysteries. We're obviously going to spend a couple days getting these on Tuesday office. Who goes to the Department of Mysteries from the DA? Obviously, Harry. Hermione, Hermione Granger, Ron Weasley, Jenny Weasley, Neville Longbottom, Luna Notice we haven't talked about Luna's name. Okay. Luna implies what? Moon is what it means. But it's the same word from which we get lunatic and loony love good. Love good. Hmm. We'll talk about that more later. So they all go. And they get to the Department of Mysteries. They get through the round room. They go through the various doors. What kind of rooms are there in the Department of Mysteries? We have the death room, right? The veil. Death is a mystery. What else? Brain room. Okay. Because the mind is a mystery. What else? Prophecy room. Okay. Space. Time. And then there's like a. It's supposed to explain too, but the door that's always locked, it's like a. <laughs> what room in the Department of Mysteries, Dumbledore is going to say, is always kept locked? Love. Okay? We see them go through each of these. This is the one with the clocks. The one Death Eater gets knocked into the clock, and he. 
shrinks down to a baby and grows. We go into the space room or kind of like natural sciences somewhat. The prophecy room, brain, death. But they go into the death room. Who wants to get the hell out of there the fastest? Why? Because there isn't any book that explains anything really about death. And yet, it's the one room Harry seems particularly drawn to. What does it have in it? It's got the stairway up to the arch. You come down the stairway. It's got a flat space. And it's got the arch. Hanging from the arch is a veil. And the veil's moving slightly. And yet there's no air conditioning in this room. And there's no wind. And Harry and Luna hear what? Hello? Anybody there? Harry goes and walks around it. There's nobody behind it. Right? Hermione's like, Harry, let's get out of here. And he's getting closer and closer. So they go to the department of, uh, excuse me, the prophecy room. Harry takes down the prophecy. What does it say on it? Page 780. SPT to APWBD, Dark Lord and question mark. <coughs> Notice, when does Harry Potter get added to it? Later. After Voldemort attempts to curse Harry. Why? This is the whole meaning of the prophecy. Voldemort chooses who the prophecy is about. Okay? Beyond the veil. Who goes beyond the veil? Why? He's not actually killed. Everybody else in the room is done fighting. Okay. Dumbledore has arrived. And what happens? Harry, uh, excuse me, Sirius smarts off. He says, ah, come on, you can do better than that. <laughs> As he gets hit square in the chest, we're told not with a green um, jet. We're told it's not even, there's not even a color. Page 805. Come on, you can do better than that. As Harry C. Sirius Duck Bellatrix's jet of red light the first time. The second jet of light hits him squarely on the chest. He falls through the veil. Harry runs around. Where'd he go? <laughs> He's not there. Okay. We'll stop there. We're going to pick up with the only one he ever feared. Uh, we're probably going to end up spending about 20 minutes or so, at least. I've been worried, 30. Because we have to talk about the debriefing and the prophecy. Uh, but we'll pick that up even more in book six, because Harry doesn't understand the prophecy until book six.